Hello, all of those people that are joining us. I can see the numbers going up and up and up. For those of you who, um, who don't know me, I'm Wendy Humphreys from IWA Lancashire and Cumbria branch. And uh, joining us this evening is Bill Fogger from Canal and River Trust. Bill is the Heritage Advisor. So that's, that's all I've got to say for now. So um, I'll let Bill say a little bit more about himself and start his presentation. Thank you, Bill. Over to you. Thank you very much, Wendy. My name's on the screen there, you can see that. Um, and I'm um, one of the Trust's uh, heritage advisors and um, it's our role to help our colleagues um, look after the, um, you know, the, the built uh, heritage, the, the, the locks and the bridges and the buildings and so on in a manner um, which is um, you know, suitable for a building which is 200, 250 years old, which might be listed, might be protected by law. And then um, my particular area of responsibility is the Leeds and Liverpool Canal. So it used to be the whole of the canal, but now it's just the Lancashire section. So from Liverpool to Greenfield, um, Barn Altswick area, and uh, also the Lancaster Canal, uh, which now stretches from um, um, Preston northwards. Uh, I'll say to Kendall, not quite to Kendall, uh, but um, for the benefit of uh, doubt, it used to go to Kendall and we're hopeful that it may well extend to Kendall once again. Um, but, so the Liverpool docks um, sort of falls within my area of, of responsibility, but because um, the trust, the trust's area, the trust interest in the docks is mainly um, the water and managing the water space, uh, making sure that the, 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 the river gates work and the, the ships can get into the docks and uh, keeping the docks dredged and so on. And as a consequence, my professional um, um, work on the docks is qu quite limited. Um, but whenever I've gone to Liverpool, I've looked at the docks and I've looked at some of the, uh, the fabulous architecture there. And I thought to myself, there must be a story behind these docks. You know, why are they here? Um, they, they certainly didn't appear overnight. And um, I, I, well, basically I asked Father Christmas for a book about the docks and Father Christmas provided one. Um, and then um, very shortly afterwards, uh, I found um, a fabulous website, um, which I'll show you the link to at the end, um, which shows um, historic maps of Liverpool. Um, uh, you know, maps prior to the Ordnance Survey. So the Ordnance Survey around about 1840. Uh, but this website shows um, basically maps uh, from the start of, start of Liverpool, you know, way back to 1700, something like that. And the combination of the two, um, the, the book about the historic docks and the maps, um, you know, really, really fired my, my interest. So I, I'm really, um, I'm going to, um, uh, hang on a minute. There we go. So really what I'm going to now do is impart to you some of the things that I've learned uh, but it's a big subject and we're only going to scratch the surface. So hopefully it'll, you know, engender an interest in you and you can go away and do some research yourself. But before I start looking at the maps, uh, I want to, because I'm conscious that there are people from all over the country who may not have been to Liverpool. So I want to do some a bit of orientation. So what you can see on the screen now is if you like the docks uh, in the center of Liverpool. So in, in the background, uh, is a Liverpool city centre and the, the one uh, I've highlighted in blue with the, the warehouses surrounding it is the, the iconic Albert Dock, uh, perhaps uh, the best preserved of the historic docks um, with the, um, the, the grade one warehouses around it. Um, this, is, this is the dock where the guy used to do the weather from, from the floating map back in the, the early 90s, late 80s, I don't sure remember that. And then um, a little bit further back, I've highlighted a blue square. That is the um, the site of the first ever commercial wet dock uh, in the world, uh, latterly called the old dock, uh, but probably not always called the old dock because at one stage it was new. Um, and then uh, on the left hand side, uh, you'll see some um, some blue lines, um, which I've drawn on 
the, the air photo, a couple of blue boxes. Uh, they are the original terminus of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal, uh, which arrived in, um, in Liverpool uh, in 1774, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, so yeah, it arrived in February 1774. Um, what I would like you to do is um, just, if you can see my uh, uh, pointer, I'll make it a laser pointer. You see that tall building there? I'd like you to uh, keep that in your mind for later because I'm going to make reference to that tall building a bit later. So in, in the middle of the screen, you can see probably what, the, what everybody knows about Liverpool and it's the iconic uh, three buildings which are known as the th Three Graces, uh, which hopefully you can see now. And um, they um, were from, uh, from, from right to left. They are um, the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board HQ. Um, which was built in 1903-1907 uh, um, and they are that's a, a, a grade two star listed building. Next building to be built is uh, the, the one on the left, the Royal Liver building which was uh, recently used for filming of Batman uh, but that was built in 1908-1911 uh, um, and when it was built it, it, it rather put the, um, the Mersey docks and harbour boards nose out of joint uh, because I think they were rather hoping for something which wouldn't overshadow their building. But as you can see, it's, well, it's much larger and uh, well, probably quite twi twice the height. Uh, and then in between, um, perhaps perhaps my favourite, the more, the more subtle uh, Cunard building, which I discovered a uh, surprise to me was built in 1914-1916. And I, I, it just surprised me that during First World War, um, a, a, a firm which specialised in... Um, you know, liners was able to uh, go to the expense of building something like that. So just a little bit further north, um, you can see the, um, again, you can see the canal str um, stretching into the center of um, Liverpool. What we have here is, um, uh, the, yes, the canal. Um, if I just, yeah. So <laughs> what you can probably tell from this shot is that um, the canal rather cuts off uh, the northern part of um, uh, Liverpool. Now, when it arrived, it didn't matter because there was um, Liverpool, which was, wasn't built up here. This was in uh, fields, basically. But as the docks moved north, it became a problem. So in uh, around about the 1880s, that uh, terminus that we can see there was moved um, to this location here. And at the same time, the road here called Pall Mall was built. And if you know Liverpool uh, at all, this is uh, Leeds Street. And this large building on the corner is uh, the Mercedes-Benz uh, garage. And um, there is very little left of the terminus now, but on Pall Mall, you, you can see the remains of the, uh, the, the warehouses which were built at the terminus. So that was moved in um, 18, uh, the 1880s. Um, and um, what you can also see here, I, I've, I've called this slide Jesse's Annus Mirabilis or 1848. Um, the reason why I've called it that is because the docks that we can see, which I'm um, highlighting here, including the link up to the canal, were all built in one, or opened in one year, in uh, 1848. Um, and they were, they were built by the then dock engineer, Jesse Harley, uh, who I shall mention a bit later. Um, and then, um, it, what you can also see quite markedly from this shot is the different colours of water. Um, the, the River Mersey at the front, very, very silty. And um, this uh, always caused, well, has always caused the docks problems and still causes the docks problems. Um, we, for example, um, I mentioned earlier, are responsible for keeping the docks uh, seaworthy. And we spend a lot of money um, dredging at the docks, particularly the uh, uh, Canning Half Tide, which is next to Albert Dock, and the river entrance outside in the river, so that the tall ships can still get in. And in fact, over the last uh, four years, we've spent something like 500, 600,000 pounds keeping those um, dredged. But also from this um, shot, you can see uh, some of the different ways that the docks um, uh, used to provide entrances so over here, you can see the entrance to what I believe is Salisbury Dock. You've got a, a traditional sort of gate, which you might expect, and 
quite, quite similar, I think, to a lock gate. But further down here, which is the entrance to Waterloo, that's a later entrance. And you'll see it specifically points upstream. Um, and the, the idea was that it would, you know, try and prevent so much silt coming into, into the docks. Uh, interestingly, I've seen a photograph from, from the 1980s, which is uh, around about the time that the docks were restored. And up to the 1980s, for about 10 years, I think this, the, 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 the sea could come into docks with the tide and leave with the tide because there was no gate. And it brought in so much silt that this photo of the Albert Dock looks like it's full of water, but it actually is just full of silt. Uh, so a real problem for us. Also, what you can see on, on this shot, I, I mentioned the link up to the uh, canal and here the, uh, the cul-de-sacs of the Aldonian village. Um, a, a, an unusual, I think, um, from an architectural perspective, you don't tend to see this sort of, um, you know, cul-de-sac style arrangement in a city. And um, the architectural um, commentator Owen Hather Hatherley described this sort of thing as, um, he said, a, a walk through um, Liverpool is like one minute you're in Berlin and the next you're in Basingstoke. And he was referring to uh, things like um, the Eldonian village. But the Eldonian village was built from the 1980s and it was the response of the local communities um, to breathe life back into an area that was, you know, falling on its uppers because um, the docks had closed and the industry had closed and people were leaving because there was no work and there was nowhere to live. So the, the community um, took the bull by the horns and built their own community and the Aldonian village is what we um, uh, 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 had built. Uh, something which uh, I think Prince Charles has praised. Um, but um, if we just look at this block here next to Burlington Street and there we've got Chisenhale Street, in here was uh, Tate and Lyle, the, the sugar refinery. This was all industry, uh, but that was Tate and Lyle, which closed in uh, 1981. I've got a picture of uh, this block here coming up. Um, so this is Burlington Street going down one side, Chisenhale Street the other, uh, with the canal going through it. You can see uh, from this picture how much this area has changed over the last um, 30, 40 years. And um, so a little bit further along, um, oops, wrong way. So I, I call this picture the fourth grace. And um, I, I imagine that some of you are going to disagree with um, what I'm going to put forward now, um, but that's fine. Uh, but I call this the fourth grace because I believe, we looked at the first three graces, I believe this building that we're gonna look at in a second is a good candidate for being the fourth grace of Liverpool. Uh, so what we're looking at, we get into a uh, part of Liverpool now is, you know, it's it's not where the tourists go. You can see the docks, are, they're, they're still quite heavily industrial. Um, there's lots of, looks like scrap metal on the wharfs and so on and so forth. But in the centre, we're looking at Huskisson Dock here and we're looking at, um, what's, the, what's the next one called? Um, I can't remember, is it Canada, Canada Dock? Um, and then uh, in the centre, which you can perhaps, perhaps see, I'm just going to highlight it here, is um, a building which, if you've ever driven down this uh, Great Howard Street here, you will have seen this building, uh, a magnificent building. It is um, the, the, the sugar silo, which was built in um, 1955, 1957, designed by the Tate and Lyle uh, Engineering Department, specifically uh, to keep um, sugar cane. So you can see, um, if I just go back again, it points, if you like, at Huskisson Dock, so that the ships would come in here. There was like a conveyor belt going over the road, which would go into the dock just here and dump the building full of uh, um, sugar cane. Um, the, the, the reinforced concrete floor acts as a, the tie bar for this arch. So there is no supports in there. You have a space 160 meters long, 26 meters wide with no supports whatsoever. And, and, and I think, you know, a good candidate for being, um, you know, the fourth grace. And like I say, you might disagree with me, but um, it's an important building. And we'll, we'll look at a picture of the warehouses around Albert Dock later on. And they are all protected by law, grade one, I think. 
uh, and we look at those and we see a thing of beauty but they weren't built for beautiful to be beautiful they're built for a purpose um to store stuff um in the way that they built stuff in the 1840s and that's exactly what's happened here this is the way we built stuff in the 1950s um, and, and i think in future people will um, value that building i was really pleasantly surprised to discover that it actually is grade two star listed that building so historic england also agree with me and then the final um shot uh, we're up in bootle now uh, which is north north liverpool you can see the lead, the, the canal the leeds liverpool canal snaking through here heading southwards um again we're looking at um the um the, the 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 docks which are still used over on the right hand side you can see the, the sugar silo we were just talking about and i just want to draw your attention to this green field here if i just flash it there um yeah the flash there a little green field um founded by light industry um and why do i bring this to your attention it is the site of this church saint mary's church of uh, that was in bootle not there anymore um, because um, it was it fell victim of the Blitz during the war um, and it was um, demolished. And I, I bring it to your attention because this is the last resting place of Jesse Hartley. Uh, I mentioned Jesse Hartley um, earlier. He, he probably is the, probably the most first equal, most <laughs> significant end dock engineer. Um, he he um, increased the amount of water space um, in his uh, went whilst he was engineer from um, some, something like 360 percent some something like uh, I've got a figure somewhere um, uh, can't find the figure um, but something like 18 um, 18 hectares to 300 hectares something like that so he, he, he was uh, he, he's basically Mr Liverpool and he is buried in this little spot here and you would walk past it and you wouldn't know, which I, th I think is something of a shame. Um, so, but um, final, finally, um, what we see here is the Royal Seaforth Dock. It's the most northerly dock and it was opened in 1972. And 1972, if you like, marked the closure of all the historic docks south of here. Um, the docks had to develop because ships got bigger and you know, you can't get a container ship in Albert Dock, obviously. So they, they had to continue developing the docks. This was the last one built, Royal Sea Fourth Dock. Uh, the, I think the other reason for showing this is because it really demonstrates how all of these docks in Liverpool were actually built in the river on reclaimed land. Um, and you can see up here, uh, the coast actually goes back to where it used to be. This is Crosby up here. Um, so it really illustrates how all of our docks in Liverpool were reclaimed. But that ultimately is the end of the story. So we need to go to the start of the story uh, with this map, which, um, okay, so I've put 1644 there. This map was not drawn up in 1644, uh, but it shows uh, an event which happened in 1644, and that was the siege of Liverpool during the Civil War. Um, uh, Prince Rupert's um, uh, positions over here. Uh, to cut a long story short, Prince Rupert won the siege of Liverpool. He was obviously on the Royalist side. With the help of his magic dog and his magic monkey that's another story which you can go and google um, but the real uh, purpose of showing you this map is because it shows the pool which allegedly is what liverpool was named after uh, this inlet here and this inlet here um, and it also shows um, the problem that liverpool had uh, and why it decided to build its first dock so um, in 1680, 1690, um, the, the, the population of Liverpool started to increase like many, many towns. Um, it was ideally suited for trading with the, the, the colonies in America. They'd become established by 1650 and they'd started trading with, uh, with, with um, Britain. And if I just might um, give you a few stats here about uh, imports um, coming into uh, Liverpool. In 1665, for example, no tobacco was landed at Liverpool, but by 1700, 1.75 million pounds of tobacco was uh, landed. So sugar, in 1665, 700 hundredweight was landed in Liverpool, and by 1700, 11,600 hundredweight. In terms of exports, 
uh, of salt in 1665. 6,000 bushels left Liverpool in 1700. That was 300,000 bushels leaving um, Liverpool. And you can see the problem because this, this shows uh, the, the low tide mark. The, the ships had to anchor in the water and it was only possible to empty them during high tide. So it took quite a bit of time. Someone told me it'd take three weeks to empty a boat, maybe empty and reload it. I don't know if that's true, uh, but you, you, you begin to get a, a, a picture of uh, what the problem was. So the, the, um, the, the Harbour trustees uh, decided to build a wet dock. Not the first wet dock, it won't be the first wet dock in the country. Deptford and Portsmouth had um, docks in um, uh, the built in the 16th century. Then there was Blackwall and Rotherhive docks, all wet docks in London. The difference between this one was that this was built for commercial purposes and the others were not. They were built by the Navy or they were built as a place of shelter or a place to um, uh, repair ships. But this one was built specifically for commercial use. And um, they um, um, decided to build a wet dock. Um, a, a chap called, I should introduce the other most significant um, dock engineer, Thomas Deers, who happened to be from Rotherhive. So he would have been familiar with Rotherhive Dock, Great Howland Dock. And he'd been, um, he fought in uh, William of Orange's army uh, in the Low Countries. So in addition to being having, um, you know, experience of Rotherhive Dock, he would have uh, had experience of, the, you know, the, the management of water as they were doing in, um, in the Low Countries. And he suggested in 1710 that um, they build their wet dock actually just where, where, in fact, where my cursor is now, actually reclaimed land, build it there uh, so much easier, he said, than um, digging, you know, excavating from land. And the trustees agreed and they took him on, took, took, took him up on his uh, plan and they built the first wet dock in, in, in the world, commercial wet dock in the world, which is just here where you can see. Actually, if I do that again, I've tried to put this map in the same place. So uh, it appears in the pool as it was. So we have the first wet dock here, opened in 1715 uh, with some additions at the, at the entrance, 1717, uh, basically a tidal basin and a, a graving dock. Um, and um, part of that dock, I mean, I, I, I hinted on my first slide that that dock doesn't exist anymore, but some of it does remain and you, you're able to go and visit it. Um, on a guided tour, uh, if you go to the Maritime Museum, this is a shot of it. This is the top corner where my um, cursor is at the moment, the top uh, top left-hand corner. Uh, immediately you can see it's made of brick. And if you have any knowledge of the, the, the rest of the Liverpool docks, you'll know that they're now all made of stone. Um, and um, you can also see that they chopped out some of the bedrock, the, the red sandstone, which is the bedrock in Liverpool. Uh, building a, a dock out of uh, bricks, uh, well, they learned from that. Um, I, I did go on a tour uh, with, with the guide from the museum and it's him that, that said that it took three weeks to, um, to empty a boat previously. Uh, he also mentioned that um, uh, the, the, the walls uh, were frequently damaged. You've got a big boat bouncing up against them. Uh, it knocks, dislodges bricks. But actually shipwrights apparently used to take the wall down so they could get their boats into it. Uh, I've heard also that the tide used to come over the wall. So they certainly learned from that mistake and any future docks were... Um, built from stone. But, um, but Thomas Steers um, is important because he set, he set the standard because every other dock, apart from one uh, that was built in Liverpool, uh, was reclaimed from the sea, from the river. Uh, this, this next plan, John Eyes, uh, 1768. John Eyes was um, uh, a contemporary of Thomas Steers and he did in fact work with Steers um, now, um, surveying the Calder and Hebel navigation but his map I show you because it shows the second dock to be built. Uh, so we've got the old dock in the middle here. Already it's called the old dock. It's only 53 years old. Uh, and then to the south of that, we've got the south dock, uh, which was the second one to be open, uh, which was opened in, uh, let me just check, um, 1753. Thomas Steers started building this, but he died in uh, 1750 and it was finished by his uh, if you like, his apprentice, Henry Berry. 
uh, who became the second uh, dock engineer. We now, that, now that, that dock still exists. So if you like, it's the oldest remaining dock. We now call it Salter House Dock. Uh, it was called South Dock then because it was south of the old dock. If you look here, we have Salter House Lane and Salter House Yard. This was, if you like, the terminus of the salt industry. This is where the salt was brought from Cheshire uh, to this location and then put onto the boats in, in the South Dock and taken away. Hence, it became known as uh, Salter House Dock. So uh, um, it also includes uh, the intended dock here on the, on the left-hand side. Um, that was to become uh, George's Dock, uh, which uh, where the Three Graces now stand. So George's Dock was built and then filled in later, the Three Graces built, built there. In the middle, we have what looks like Canning Dock uh, to anyone who knows the area, but you'll also see it's called a Dry Pier. For, for many years, this was simply a, a tidal basin, which later became a dock. But so for the moment, we've got two docks, the old dock and the south dock. In 1715, when the old dock was opened, um, combined import and export from that dock was 37,000 tons. In 1752, when the south dock was opened, the combined export was 60,000 tons, 60,900. In 1771, when George's dock was opened, it was 133,000 tonnes. And by 1800, it was 400,000 tonnes. And that essentially is why we ended up with so many docks in Liverpool, because every time they built one, they filled up. They could not keep pace with the growth of trade with America and presumably um, the rest of the empire, because the empire was building up. And as a consequence, they kept building docks one after the other after the other. And they were partially able to do this because the, uh, the Mersey docks trustees and the harbour trustees were essentially probably the same people who were sat on the town council. So they were making money out of the docks. And of course, they were going to say, oh, yes, let's, you know, let's build some more, let's build some more. And if there was any, um, 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 you know, any, any voices in the town who didn't want any more, they tended to get ignored. They did need an act, of course, and needed an act of parliament to build the docks, which they readily got anyway. So the first map, so the next map is the first map, which doesn't come off this website I mentioned. It's the first map relates to the, 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 the canal. Um, the Leeds and Liverpool Canal, they started building it in 1770. They started building it in, um, um, in West Lanx, near Ormskirk, a place called Halsall, and they started building at Skipton in Yorkshire around about the same time. Um, and for many years, they just had two canals. They had a canal from Skipton to Leeds, and they had a canal which was essentially from Wigan to Liverpool. And the canal wasn't completed, so you couldn't sail from Leeds to this terminus that we can see here until 1816. But um, this, uh, so this, this was the original terminus. Now I showed you that on the first picture, if you remember. Um, this shows, if you like, that um, it arrived on the north side of Liverpool through fields. Uh, you can see uh, the basin here, the basin here, there's another basin here. Uh, you can see some of the buildings which are associated with the terminus. Just here we've got some offices, just here we've got more offices. Just this building here, the, the coal office and a warehouse here. As a, as, a, as a buildings nerd, I feel terribly sad that this is no longer there. And I don't know what those buildings looked like, but we have a hint of what they looked like because in the marginalia of this map, um, they were drawn. Um, so um, we have some offices here and perhaps these buildings uh, represent this row of offices just there. In the middle, we've got the Stopgate House, which unfortunately you can't see because I've obscured it by this picture. And just here, we have the coal office. And this building is this coal office just here. And even better, and despite everything, one of these buildings actually survives 200 years of redevelopment to um, the Blitz during the 1940s. And it is this coal office here. And this building here, which is on the corner of the basin, still exists. It's this building here. Uh, I was over the moon to discover this was still there. Uh, you can see it's been extended a little bit. You can see that that, that uh, joint there. Um, if I just move this picture, let's actually just do that. 
and there we go, that's better. Uh, you can see this door is now a window. And if, if you remember uh, on that first slide, I said, look at this really tall building and remember it, because I'm going to mention it again. This is a really tall building behind that I was pointing at. This is the Radisson Hotel, which is essentially built in the, um, um, in the former Canal Basin. And uh, as, uh, you know, despite everything, this, this canal building has survived, which is, I think is fantastic. Um, so alterations and additions. Um, in 1810, um, you can see this, this map was produced in about 1810 when they were looking to uh, increase um, the, 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 the water space. The blue ones show the docks which exist, existed at this time. King's Dock, just off the side here, we've got Queen's Dock, Salt House Dock, George's Dock. Actually, the old dock still existed, but it was a proposal. Part of this proposal was to fill it in. And um, off the right hand side of this, you can't see, um, there was um, an extension proposed to Queen's Dock and also uh, Brunswick Dock was proposed. And also this dock in the center, uh, which was to become Prince's Dock. Uh, these purple buildings are uh, warehouses that they were proposing, a new tobacco warehouse here. This is the existing tobacco warehouse. Uh, this is a proposed tobacco warehouse, demonstrating perhaps how much tobacco was coming through. Uh, now you can see I've put two dates on the top of this map. And if you look carefully, on the left-hand side of this map, someone has pasted an extension to it. And that um, was pasted on by um, uh, the canal, the Leeds Liverpool Canal Committee because they were opposed to extending the docks to the south down here, because that wouldn't really have helped the canal. They were bringing coal here. They wanted the docks close to here so they could get the coal to the docks from here. And they didn't really want to have to cart all the coal down here. So they made this uh, alternative proposal, which would see uh, Regent's Dock and Derby Dock and Prince's Dock built here, but significantly for the first time, also a link up to the canal. Well, to cut a long story short, that proposal was not accepted. And um, they um, went ahead and um, this map shows that they've built Prince's Dock. Um, you can see the old dock is still there because um, it hadn't been filled in by 1824. Again, off the, off the right hand side, you can't see, but Queen's Dock was extended. Uh, and over on the left hand side to the north, um, they're already talking about making more docks. And these became um, Waterloo Dock and Victoria Dock and Trafalgar Dock. The other significant thing about this picture is that Prince's Dock, you can see it's got a wall around it for the first time. The other docks don't. Uh, and this wall was built for security purposes um, because in 1803, the Warehousing Act allowed um, London uh, docks to build bonded warehouses, which meant that they could unload the ships into the docks, into the warehouses without a customs and excise person being present. Um, to note how much tax was owed. So they could un unload the cargo, put it in the dock, and only after it left the, the warehouse um, was tax payable. And this meant that it was much quicker to empty the boats and get them reloaded and get the boats back out again. But um, they weren't allowed to do this in Liverpool because the authorities said your security is too lax. And we, we, we considered that you will unload stuff and it will just disappear. And this, this, this painting here, which actually is probably a lot later, 1870, 1880, is John Atkinson Grimshaw, a Leeds artist, shows um, a canning dock to the left with a forest of uh, masts. And you can see that basically the dock was in the center of town and anything which came off the dock onto the wharf could easily have gone walkies. Uh, and so that's why they started uh, building uh, into the dock design security. On the right hand side is a customs house, which hasn't been built yet on our, uh, at our point, but it was built on the old dock. This is the same map we were looking at a minute ago. I just wanted to zoom out a little bit, just so you could see how the docks are dominating Liverpool. They're almost the whole of Liverpool. So um, let's move on. Uh, this is uh, uh, um, probably one of the most detailed maps on this site. And I, I um, you know, ask you to go and look at it because this is one great detail. Already I can see that I've only got 10 minutes left, so I'm going, I'm going on too much, but um, we can see from this 1836 map, you can see that in the middle, we now have Canning Dock. This is, if you like, is the first, the first act of Jesse Hartley. You can see that now the old dock has been filled in. It's filled in in 18, 
um, 26. And on top of it was built uh, the customs house. This little bit of writing says the intended customs house. They started building that in 1826, sorry, 1828, and um, probably were still building it in 1836. Over here, you can see Prince's Dock, which we were talking about with the wall around it. Another view of this map, sorry, no, let's go back. The customs warehouse. This photograph is taken, this you can see in the foreground, a, um, a swing bridge just here, which is a swing bridge between Canning Dock and Salthouse Dock. Uh, and there is the magnificent customs house. And it, it just tells you, doesn't it, how much money Liverpool's making from these docks. Uh, that, that building says it all. Uh, unfortunately, it was um, the victim of the Blitz in the 40s and obviously is no longer present. Then we have, um, draw your attention to Clarence Dock here, which um, although there are do docks in between Prince's Dock and Clarence Dock, they, um, they, didn't, they actually jumped this area and built this dock separate for the first time. This uh, was built in uh, 1830. And they did that because it was specially built for steamboats and they didn't want that fire risk near their warehouses. So they built it separately. Uh, but as I said earlier, they continu continued to build docks. Uh, so they, they soon filled in that area. Waterloo Dock was there, intended dock, uh, Trafalgar and Victoria Dock here, and then the fort to guard the lot. Let's have a quick look at the terminus. This is quite interesting because it shows you who has got um, the yards against the terminus. Most of them are coal yards. We've got Rebecca Thompson just here, Rebecca Thompson's coal yard. The Earl of Balcarra's coal yard. He was a major coal uh, owner around Wigan. Then we've got the Leeds Union Company's wharf. And most interestingly, just here in prime spot, John Hustler & Co's coal yard. And down here, Hustler & Co coal yard, right in prime spot. Hus John Hustler was a, a merchant from Bradford. Um, and he was one of the prime movers for this canal. He promoted it and probably wouldn't have happened without him. May not have happened without him. And lo and behold, Having built it, we see he gets the best spot on the canal for his coal yard. And interestingly, uh, when he died, he, he, he went on also, he was the treasurer of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal. And uh, when it was noted, when he died in 1790, so he, he was dead by now, um, the, the, the note in the committee was uh, Mr. Hustler, the late worthy treasurer, indefatigable and disinterested promoter of this canal was dead to the irreparable loss of this company. But he may well have been indefatigable, but he certainly wasn't disinterested, was he? Because he was definitely making money out of this canal. And this sort of thing didn't go down very well with um, shareholders because they thought that the committee members were making decisions for their own benefit and not the benefit of the shareholders. That's another story. Um, it's a quick word on the jail, which we've ignored, but that was uh, built as a response to jail reformer John Howard in about 1790s. And you'll see the Great Howard Street, his name, John Howard, lives on in Great Howard Street, which still exists on a major, major road in Liverpool. And very quickly, uh, this is the site of the um, Albert Dock, John, John uh, to Jesse Hartley's Triumph Albert Dock here. You can see actually it was shipwrights yards. There was a street there, Trentham Street, and then there were ship, ship, shipwrights yards. Um, so um, in, um, it was, um, Around about the 18, about around about 1840, um, they decided that they needed to extend the docks. 1841, they got the um, the Dock Act, which enabled them to build the Albert Dock, um, and it was completed just here in this location here uh, in 1845, 1846. And this this dock was an, absolutely a response to security. It had its warehouses around it, and it meant that you could empty the boats directly into the warehouses and then um, the boats could get you know get refilled and moved on. Um, I, I should just mention here Duke's dock on the right hand side I've not mentioned that before but this was probably the only dock built by a private um, firm not not by the, the docks the dock trustees and that was built by the Duke of Bridgewater as the terminus for his own canal and the, the Bridgewater Canal. That might explain why it looks like a canal, because his engineers were able to build canals. Um, so um, next map, um, I don't know if you call this a map or not, I, I'm going to call it a map. Um, but this was uh, 1847, so um, the year after 
Albert, Albert Dock was built, and you can see it here with the the, the fabulous uh, warehouses around it. Uh, the customs warehouse is now completed just there. Um, King's Dock with a tobacco warehouse on the front. There's Duke's Dock. Um, you can see the walls around Prince's Dock uh, and the walls around um, Clarence Dock and uh, the other docks, Waterloo Dock. And that, that security wall is still there. You can walk up this road and you can look at that wall. Um, what what I, I find amazing about this shot, and I don't know if it's artistic license, may well be how full those docks are. Probably artistic license, but if you think back to that um, Atkinson painting we saw earlier, a similar sort of thing was said. Um, in So I mentioned um, Albert Dock was opened in 1846. In 1844, when he was building it, um, before it was finished, Jesse Hartley was already telling the, the uh, dock trust we need to build more docks. And this is the letter he wrote to the docks, uh, to the committee. It appears to me, uh, it appears very clear to me when the whole of our docks are so full of shipping as not to permit of one of the 14 to run dry for the purpose of effecting those repairs which time and corrosion ever produce and render essential. And particularly when the crowding of shipping is not of a transit character, but occurring at all times from the progressing increase of trade that more dock space is necessary for the well-being and efficient working of our whole. So he's not finished Albert Dock yet, and he's already asking for more dock space. He goes on significantly to say, I would then propose that steps should be taken for the accommodation of the coasting trade, which in my opinion, might be affected the most conveniently by forming a connection through the docks between the river and the Leeds and Liverpool Canal. And it was Jesse Hartley that built the link to the canal, not the canal company, although he did pass it over to the canal when it was completed. But uh, bearing in mind the, the, the canal had been here since 1774, it wasn't until 1848 that it was actually ultimately connected to um, the, the docks. And I, I mentioned um, Jesse's Annus Mirabilis earlier, 1848. That was the year that all of these docks here opened um, Stanley Dock, Collingwood Dock, Salisbury Dock, Nelson Dock, Bramley Moor Dock, as well as the link up to um, the, uh, the canal. All of those op opened on the same day in 1848. What a mammoth task. Um, 1858, as you can see here, is come towards the end of Jesse Hartley's tenure because he died in 1860. And even after, after building these in 1848, he continued north, he kept on going, and he kept on going south. But this map it being sort of towards the end of Jesse Hartley's tenure, it enables me to it enables me to show you really how much he did. And those docks which I've highlighted now were the docks which existed when he came to be the dock engineer. These ones are the ones which existed when he finished. So it really just illustrates how important Jesse Hartley was to um, to Liverpool. Um, this is uh, I'm. I'm this is basically the end of my presentation. There, there are more docks, um, but I don't want to talk about them. I just want to show you these a couple of images. You, when, if you go to Liverpool docks, and if you haven't been, well worth a trip, and walk off the beaten path. Don't just stay in the uh, tourist area of Albert Dock, which is shown on the left. But Albert Dock is incredible, fabulous warehouses, but um, Hartley also in, introduced Lots of little, lots of little beautiful little bits of architecture like these, and and these are the the gatehouses um, at um, the entrance to Stanley Dock, um, and um, unfortunately you can't go in it now. Until recently you could go in there, and there's a little fireplace and a little penguin edition of a book. Um, the the gatekeeper would sit in there and um, check anyone was coming in and coming out, and that way they could make sure no one was stealing the wares, if you like. Uh, great location, Stanley Dock. Um, site of the uh, the, the massive uh, tobacco warehouse, which is now being turned into apartments. Also, site, uh, site of the um, Titanic Hotel, which now occupies the the North Warehouse. And so, finally, this again, probably not a map, but I'm going to call it a map for now. Um, this, um, if you like, 1859. So this really is showing uh, the Liverpool docks as they were when Jesse Hartley finished his lifetime's work. You can see Albert Dock just here and the other docks stretching off 
towards the north. Um, and, and, and also on the left hand side, the nascent Birkenhead docks, uh, which were built. Um, there was, a, I think it was Telford who said the Liverpool docks should never have been built in Liverpool. They should have been built in Birkenhead because Birkenhead was, uh, had a much better um, topography for it. There's a massive inlet, as you can see here, um, which would uh, and did, in fact, enable docks to be built. All the docks on Liverpool had to be built out into the river. Um, so I think it was Telford who said that they should have been built in Birkenhead. Of course, the problem with Birkenhead was that it was across the water, so not um, ideal for transport purposes. Um, so two sources I have used. Um, one of them, um, and I encourage you to go and look at this, historicliverpool.co.uk, old maps of Liverpool. And I think probably if you gurgle, uh, gurgle, if you Google um, historic Liverpool, old map of Liverpool, you'll find that site. And look at that, um, that uh, gauge map that I told you about. Uh, fabulous detail. In fact, it's the one you can see in the background. Even tells you how long the streets are. And the other um, source is this book by um, Nancy Ritchie Noakes. Uh, this, this was uh, written about uh, 30 years ago, in 1984, I think it was published, when uh, the docks were being restored. And uh, it's a really interesting, really uh, useful book. Um, the other thing I'll say, um, I, I pointed out, didn't I, that George's dock was filled in and had um, the three graces built on it. And uh, the old dock was filled in and had uh, the customs house built on it. Most of the docks that you will see now are not in the form that they were when they were built. One of the, the characteristics of the Liverpool docks was that they constantly changed to account for the bigger ships coming in and uh, the differences in trade. And probably the only, well, it's not quite the only dock, but one of the few docks which hasn't changed is Albert Dock. And Albert Dock couldn't change because they built warehouses around it. They couldn't make it bigger. They couldn't make the entrances bigger. So it had to stay as it was. And as a consequence, despite being a fabulous dock, it wasn't such a great success. Um, and by the 1890s, um, it had fallen, really, really fallen out of, into disuse. So constant change in the docks. And it's still happening because now the council are talking about um, filling in uh, Bramley Moor Dock and building um, a football stadium on it for Everton. So um, that's that's really all I want to say. I mean, we've come to, I'm three minutes over. So uh, I think uh, th th there were other things I was going to talk about, but I think probably um, I'll, I'll stop it there and invite Wendy um, to rejoin us, uh, if you're there, Wendy. And um, if, if anyone's got any uh, questions, I'll uh, try and answer them. Um, but my knowledge is not in depth on the docks. Um, this is very, very much a skin deep presentation. Uh, so I'll try and answer your questions. And uh, if there's any we can't answer, as Wendy said earlier, we'll, we'll do a bit of research afterwards and send an email out. Yeah, there's some questions at the bottom, Bill. Can you see them? Okay, are the um, oh, Q&A? Oh, there we go. Look, yes, yeah. I've not seen that before. <clears throat> do you have maps of the canals? Yes, so I've got, um, I, I showed you um, the 1802 survey uh, of the canal, which was done by the, um, uh, the, the canal uh, company, and that shows the canal from, um, from Wigan to Liverpool. I've uh, got some very interesting uh, information on there. Uh, I have access to those. They're not on that website, but I do have access to them. Um, I probably can't show them now. Um, is it sugar cane? Yes, I think it is sugar cane. Yeah, I think they're bringing it, bringing it from um, the West Indies um, into um, um, into Liverpool and processing it in the refinery that I showed you there. Uh, the alternative being sugar beet, and I don't think that was. I mean, definitely sugar beet. I used, I used to live in um, South Lincolnshire, and I noticed there was someone from Soham on there as well, which is sort of the area. I used to grow a lot of sugar beet in that area and they used to refine it in Peterborough. And the reason why they refined it in Peterborough be was because um, the cost of moving it was so high that if you had to move it too far, you weren't gonna make money out of the sugar. Uh, but I don't think that was the case with sugar cane. So yes, as, as far as I'm aware, I think it was sugar cane. Did 1664 Liverpool become Liverpool? Yes. 
I, I think um, I showed you that map with a date of 1644. It's a bit of a mishmash. One made in 1644 was made in the, I think the 19th century to show an event which occurred in 1644. And it had on it some roads which didn't exist in 1644. And if you look at the commentary on the old uh, maps website, uh, the person who's written that does make reference to Liverpool and say they probably wrote it as Liverpool to make it look like it was an oldie worldy map. Uh, but I suspect at the time the map was made, it was actually called Liverpool, but they called it Liverpool, um, uh, as I say, to make it look oldie worldy. Uh, let's go. Do we know about anything about Rebecca Thompson and the coal yard? Was she a widow taking over her husband's company? I know nothing about uh, Rebecca Thompson, and I, I, I would, I would have made the same assumption as being as, as you made there that she was a widow taking over her husband's company, uh, and and really I, I pointed her out because I think it was unusual at this time for women to run businesses, um, so that's why I pointed her out, and I would like to know more about Rebecca Thompson for that reason, but I know nothing more, um, but I mean that's a good theory that she took over from her husband. What else was I going to talk about? Um, one of the um, things that has really been at the back of my mind when doing the research for this presentation was that the Liverpool docks, the story of, of the Liverpool docks has a dark side and that dark side was slavery. And um, I don't know too much about slavery, but it's, it's come to the fore this year, hasn't it, as we all know. And anyone who's seen the latest edition of the Waterfront magazine, which is a trust magazine, will see that uh, there is an article about slavery on the canals uh, in there. Uh, the Canal and River Trust removed a statue from London of, um, I, I assume, a slave owner. Um, and um, so I did a little bit of research uh, because I thought it might come up. And um, I did the research on the internet, so I don't know how true it is. I'm sure a lot of it is, but there were some figures quoted on, on there which absolutely shocked me, I have to say. But um, the, the, the first ship to sail from Liverpool um, to pick up slaves, basically, African citizens, was in 1699. So that's before Thomas Deers built his dock which is 1715. And the, according to the internet, the worst year, if you like, of, of slave trading by Liverpool ships was 1799, so 100 years later. And this is a figure that shocked me. Uh, apparently, in that year, Liverpool ships took 45,000 African citizens over to the West Indies. So I think that's a shocking figure. And as I say, it, it was an internet um, bit of research. But either way, the trade was a shocking trade. And uh, it's, it's not really just the, the, the ship owners or the, you know, the sugar refiners or the, 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 the plantation owners who were making money out of this. Um, slavery effectively was wound through the economy of Liverpool like a piece of rope. And if you built, if you made sails, the chances are you were supporting slavery. If you made rope, you were supporting slavery. If you were a builder building docks, you were supporting slavery. It, it's very much like today, you know, in the future, people will look at us and they will say, why did so many people invest in oil when they knew it was destroying the world? But oil has so embedded in our economy today that we almost can't help but do it. And that was the same for slavery uh, back in, um, in Liverpool at this time. And then um, slavery was abolished in this country in 1803, I think it was, um, in May. And, you know, and, and almost unbelievably, the, the, the last ship to sail legally from Liverpool to pick up slaves actually sailed after the abolition of um, slavery. And it was allowed to do it because it had been given permission before slavery had been abolished. And further, because it was sailing legally, it merited an escort from the Royal Navy. 
Uh, so, you know, it's different times. Um, but uh, it's, it's worth bearing in mind that uh, whilst I, I, I'm interested in buildings personally, and I'm interested in buildings because they're built by people like you and me, and I think they're worth pre uh, preserving for that reason. Uh, but there is a dark side to the story. As I've said, is there still a half tight dock? Yes, Canning half tight dock, which is next to Albert Dock, is a half tight dock. So called, I think, because uh, I think, don't quote me, but the sill to get into it is a bit lower. So you could get into the docks a little bit, you could get into the half tight dock um, a little bit longer um, than you could get into the main docks. Um, because because the sill was lower, so Canning Half Tide was is still a half tide dock, uh, but several of the others, most of the others, I think, are, are filled in now. There's uh, tours. Are there any tours? Uh, the, the the only tour I'm aware of is the one that I took um, down to um, the old dock, um, and at, at the time I took it, it was free uh, because really all you can see is basically the photo that I showed you. There's not much left of it, but it's well worth a trip. And that is um, taken once a week by the Maritime Museum. I think you have to pay now, um, but um, uh, I don't think it's much. Uh, but the guys who take it are very knowledgeable and very entertaining. So if you're ever in Liverpool, go and have a look at it. And there may well be other tours, but I think if you go to the museums, that will be the place to look. Uh, the Maritime Museum, there is a slavery museum there as well. Are many of these docks accessible by narrowboats? Yes, they are, where you can sail down to um, the Albert docks now on the narrow boat, uh, down the Stanley Arm into Stanley into the Stanley Flight, flight which we looked at, along what we call Sid's Ditch, um, and then through um, Prince's Dock, through the Millennium Link, which was built around about 2009, and that runs in front of um, the Three Graces, and that takes you into Canning Dock, from there you go into Canning Half Tide, into Albert Dock, and then you can get to um, uh, Salt House dock from there. So those, his, the centre, basically the centre tourist centre of the docks, you can get to by narrow boat. And uh, if you've got a narrow boat on Lees and Liverpool Canal, I heartily encourage you to do that. Um, uh, does the expression to hustle come from the gentleman in his coal yard? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there's a street in Bradford where I live called Hustler Gate. And that was named after John Hustler. But whether or not um, the, the, the verb to hustle comes from his name, I, I suspect it probably doesn't, uh, because we're talking about a chap who was around, died in 1790. I suspect it's probably a, an older word, an older word uh, than that. Um, any idea what proportion of the original docks are still in water? And that's quite a difficult question, um, because as I, as I mentioned towards the end, many of the original docks don't really exist in their original form uh, anymore. Um, so uh, they, they got bigger and bigger and bigger and they changed, that, changed their form when, when, um, um, when ships got bigger. Uh, but a number of the ones at the south, uh, beyond, um, I sort of hinted at uh, Queen's Dock to the south and uh, Brunswick Dock. There were more docks, there were two or three docks south of Brunswick. They've now all been filled in. Uh, there was a number of docks between Clarence Dock and Prince's Dock, um, which we looked at, which have been filled in. Um, they're talking about filling in uh, Bramley Moor Dock uh, for the football ground. So I wouldn't like to put a finger on it. Um, a, a number of the docks where the um, arena is being built. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, the car park that burnt down, multi-storey car park burnt down in Liverpool. Uh, that was where there were there were a number of docks there which had been filled in. So, as far as I'm concerned, too many have been filled in, um, but I'm not responsible for the e economic regeneration of Liverpool. And if I was, I probably might be thinking about filling some more in and building on them. Um, um, yeah, Bill, yeah. Um, there's a lot more questions. Yeah, and the time's getting on now. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if we can if we can do as we said earlier, which, which is we'll answer people's questions by email. Um, is that okay? It's fine with me. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. much as it's very interesting to, to hear from you, and I can't believe you, you said that you, your knowledge wasn't very deep because you 
certainly been able to answer all of the questions that you've attempted to answer before I yeah. stopped you. We, um, in, in the that, land of the blind, Wendy, the one eyed man is king. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a there's, bit there's, of there's a lot more to know, isn't there? So, I, so I'd just, just like to say thank you very much for that. And, and wow, what a lot of information. And I'm not the only one saying wow, a few people on the chat have said it as well. An awful lot to take in. And one or two people have said, please do another talk. So I might be twisting your arm about that. So um, thanks very much for that. Yeah, it's my pleasure, yeah. We, we have, um, I have a few little bits of news I'd just like to say to people. I'll try, I'll try and be brief. Our, our next event for Lancashire and Cumbia in January was due to be a video evening. We, we've decided that won't work as a webinar because um, it's not the same sitting in a nice cosy social club watching old films and shouting out and you know reminiscing. I don't think you can do that on a webinar and webinars don't lend themselves very easily to video clips so we are looking around for another event in January and we'll keep you posted. The information will be on the branch website and we'll, I will send an email to members. It'll also be on the IWA um, website. I'm listening, I'm listening to the chat. So they're very distracting because I'm thinking, oh, I want to answer those. Somebody's just saying, can we do something on the Lancaster Canal? Yeah, certainly we'd love to do that. Um, the, the February meeting will be our AGM. So that will go ahead by webinar. And after the AGM, we'll have a, a nostalgia evening. We think we can still do that in the, in the webinar format. And we've got a lot of people joining us tonight who are not IWA members. And I'd like to say, you're very welcome to attend the AGM. All our meetings are open meetings, but of course you won't be able to vote unless of course you decide to join the IWA before February, in which case you'd be very welcome to vote. Um, we had our first committee meeting by Zoom yesterday, and I think it went very well. We, we're a small committee and we need new members, and a lot of people whose names I recognise here and people whose names I don't recognise, that you'd be very welcome to join our committee. We've got, we've got vacancies. Um, give us a, you know, talk to us or email us or myself or one of the other members of the, uh, of, of the committee. I always like to give a plug for our branch magazine, Tone Path Topics. The closing date is 15th of December, although there might be a little bit of flexibility around that. So if anybody's got any interesting stories, any articles um, they'd like to share with David, I'm sure he would welcome that. For example, did anybody get any boating done during the summer? Did anybody go for lots of walks along the towpath? And, and David likes pictures as well. So if, you, if anybody's kind of large, that'd be great. Um, and just a, a little bit of sad news I'd like to share with people. Uh, we heard recently that Mildred Sadler has died. Now, some of you will know Mildred, and some of you won't. We hope that we've told all of the people that we knew knew her, we've already told her, so they're not learning from me now. But uh, Mildred was a very active member of our IWA region, and she did an awful lot for our branch as well. So, uh, Lots more webinars being organised by head office. Keep an eye on the IWA website. And if you if you um, if you look, we've now got an IWA TV channel instead of YouTube. I think I don't know whether it's the same thing, but that's the place to look for them. We haven't got any other events planned for this year. Normally we would have had a Christmas meal, but we've cancelled that for obvious reasons. But we do hope that we'll be able to start running events again, in-person events um, again next year, um, once the restrictions allow us to do that. So, uh, so yeah, the, uh, th there's a couple of people I noticed who raised hands. 
and I'm not quite sure how I'm supposed to respond to raised hands. I was frantically trying to uh, to 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 find out how, and I haven't. So um, I apologise if you've raised your hand and you wanted to make a point which I've ignored. It's not that I've ignored you; it's just that I didn't know how to respond. If anybody wants, if there was anything important, you could always email me. Everybody's got my email address. So we will get back to you with answers to the questions and I'll make sure that everybody gets an email. It, it won't be immediately, but um, in the near future. So on that note then, we, we are running a little bit late, but I'm sure it's fine because it's such an interesting presentation. I'd like to say, um, Merry Christmas and a, to everybody because we won't see you before Christmas and let's hope that next year is better to um, better than better than this year. So okay, thanks again, Bill. That was brilliant yeah, as, yeah. as always. Thank you everyone um, for your kind comments as well. I will I will close the meeting any second now. Thanks very much for coming and hopefully we'll see a lot of you in uh, at our January meeting. Thank you.